mentioned. So folks, if just so you can be ahead of your uh, the logistical curve here, th again, thanks for being early and for being on time. I'm gonna ask you to follow uh, Toledo's excellent example and go ahead and just type your full name into the chat. Uh, I will also just remind you, and you may know this, that this is a brief learning community conversation today. We, this is another two hour conversation. So we'll give it just a few more minutes and we'll go ahead and get started. And for those of you who are marking and acknowledging Halloween, I wore this especially for us. This is my uh, Dracula, my Dracula pendant. Uh, so I'm wishing you all a very safe and happy Halloween if you are marking this particular particular day. And just to, to orient you, uh, this is a learning, communi uh, learning community conversation on professional boundaries. Um, and my sense is, is that many of you have participated in this learning community conversation many times and perhaps even once or multiple times a year. So I just want to acknowledge that uh, I see the smile on Carolyn's face when I said that. Mm -hmm. Yes, very, very familiar conversation. So understood, understood. And I'll say a little bit about that as we uh, as we go forward. So we'll give it just another minute. If you are by chance sharing your computer with anybody else, if they're participating with you in our conversation yesterday, a couple of folks uh, were sharing a computer. Please do make sure that their names get put into the chat as well. We want to make sure that everyone who's participating gets their two hours credit of professional boundaries uh, continuing education credit. So please make sure that everybody's name gets put into the chat. And there's Lee. Hello, Lee. Good to see you again. Uh, excellent. We'll give it just another moment or two. We are now at 58 people in the learning community. Yeah, we'll give it one more moment and then we will go ahead and get started because this is a, a brief, it's a two hour learning community conversation. So I don't wanna wait too long. And again, I will do my best to leave a little bit of time for you to be able to uh, complete the brief evaluation at the end. All right, so folks, I, 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 I think we should go ahead and get started. I don't want to tarry any longer. I want to say welcome to anyone who's here for the first time. If this is uh, the first opportunity for us to meet in a learning community conversation, I want to say welcome and thank you for making the time to be here. And to anyone who happened to be here yesterday or any other time in the past, I want to say welcome back. Thank you so much for rejoining a learning community conversation on this particular topic of professional boundaries. My name is Paul Warren, and I have the great opportunity to be the learning community conversation facilitator for today. I am a social worker by training, and for those of you who know me, I, I have mentioned in the past, and I'll just repeat this very briefly, uh, I began my social service career providing direct services to people living with HIV and AIDS in 1991, and I continued that work providing direct services until 2003, when I made the transition into predominantly training and workforce development, uh, which leads me to have the opportunity that I have today to be with all of you in the learning community. I am currently a research project director at the New York State Psychiatric Institute in New York City, and I'm also um, very pleased to be a senior staff trainer and curriculum writer for the Northeast and Caribbean Addiction Technology Transfer Center. And I know you know that it's been a long time since I've been forced to go to Puerto Rico, St. Thomas, or St. Croix to train. Yeah, I love the look on your face, <laughs> Breno. That's very good. It's been a very long time. Yeah, but um, but please, uh, maybe it'll be sometime soon. No, it's okay. I'm I'm very happy to be doing what I'm doing right now out of Central Valley, New York, uh, in New York State. 
and very happy to have the opportunity to be here with all of you. And I think I did mention yesterday that I did recently return from Denmark, from Copenhagen, where I was participating in the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers Mint Forum, where Dr. Bill Miller and Stephen Rolnick were present. And Dr. Miller gave a wonderful keynote uh, address about uh, developments in motivational interviewing, the evidence-based practice that supports behavior change, and uh, the fourth edition of their new book, which has just been released. Again, very happy to have the opportunity to be talking uh, in our learning community today about professional boundaries. And, you know, when I mentioned earlier that this is a training that you may have, or a conversation that you may have participated in multiple times, I do want to say there's one critical difference to your participation today. And, oh, the title of the book, Josh, is, uh, thanks for asking, the title of the book that Dr. Miller and Rolnick just re reduced their fourth edition is Motivational Interviewing, Helping People Change and Grow. And the and grow is something new that they've added to the book. And, and Josh, also to your question, the thing that's great about their new book is that they've really kind of tried to slim it down a bit and remove... Uh, a great deal of the technical language that seemed to present kind of a barrier to folks in having a deeper understanding of this evidence-based practice. Um, and it is available uh, now. Um, the critical difference about having this conversation, because I often think of this as what I would frame as a remembering conversation, is that we have the opportunity to be in this particular learning community with the people that are in this particular learning community. And that there's nothing new to report that I'm aware of. If there's new things to report that you're aware of, please add them to the table. But the content that I'm gonna share with you is probably not anything new to you. What will be unique is the people that will participate in the conversation and their understanding and their experience and their expertise. And that's one of the benefits of revisiting this topic as a learning community conversation. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge that and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So we'll take care of a couple of logistical details and then we will jump right into this topic. And my hope, is that we are gonna have time to get to a scenario, a professional boundaries scenario that I'd like us to be able to look at and explore as a learning community conversation. And my hope is that we're gonna to get to explore it as a learning community, as opposed to me sending it to you via the slides, because I think there's great benefit in us looking at it together as a community. So to that end, let's take care of a couple of logistics and move forward uh, in this particular topic. Which, And I'll just repeat this because I did say it yesterday for those of you that were here yesterday, but I know some of you weren't. So I'll just say this. If you're interested in this topic of motivational interviewing, in November, I am going to have the opportunity to facilitate a six-hour in-depth motivational interviewing, the theory and practice of motivational interviewing learning community conversation. And I want to invite any of you who are interested in participating in that learning community conversation to please register for that particular course, um, because it would be wonderful to have you in the learning community. Um, yeah. And in fact, I can I can put it into the chat, uh, Coley. I'm happy to do that. I'll, I'll type the title of the book in the chat. It's called Motivational. Oh, hopefully I'll spell it right. Motivational Interviewing, Helping People Change and Grow. And it's the fourth edition. And it's important to acknowledge because there are three other editions, but the beauty of this edition is that it incorporates all the most current research and there's a lot of research that's been done on this particular evidence-based practice. And for those of you who are chomping at the bit to get to professional boundaries, and, and we will, I promise you, um, I do want to make a connection. There is a great benefit 
in having an understanding of this particular evidence-based practice in regard to professional boundaries. Because oftentimes professional boundaries are about conversation and being able to engage in conversation and motivational interviewing as an evidence-based practice can really uh, facilitate and help people to communicate in a more effective and authentic way. So it's not, it may, it isn't as quite a far field as it may seem in regard to our primary topic. So I'm gonna share my screen, we'll take care of some of these logistics. And just in case you're here for tomorrow's training, today's training, uh, learning community conversation, I prefer to frame it that way, frankly, um, is that we are talking about professional boundaries. And I particularly want to thank uh, Tree Chapel for adding these three little ghosts under the date today. Um, and, and I will make a personal disclosure, and it will be the only one that I'll probably make during this learning community conversation, is that uh, Halloween is my favorite holiday of all the holidays because I have very fond childhood associations with it. So uh, I want to thank Tree so much for uh, putting those three little ghosts on the title side. And by the way, if you could just use the chat. Uh, it, yes, tis the spooky season. Understood. Yes, the, sh the slides will be shared. Um, once we receive your completed evaluation, we will send you your certificate for two hours of credit. And we will send you a copy of the slides, which include the scenario, by the way but we will send you those slides for you to use in any way that um, supports you. And what I would just ask is please use the chat. We have a little over 77 people in the learning community. If you could use the chat and just indicate by typing the letter Y, if you can see the title slide, which says professional boundaries, and you can also see me at the same time. I can't see you when I got the slides up, but, but if you can see me, that would be great. So I'm seeing a lot of, okay, great. So people can see both, fantastic. All right, so um, it, this is the learning community conversation for today. If you were hoping for the conversation for tomorrow, please come back tomorrow. And if you'd like to stay for today, it would be wonderful to have you here. So please, please stay with us if, if you'd like and you can. This is a learning community conversation. What we talk about, what I share, what you're invited to bring to the table based on your experience may not reflect the official position or views of our funder. And that's perfectly okay because we are here to have a relevant and meaningful conversation about this particular topic. And that will be unique to us as a learning community. As we engage in that, as with all of our learning community conversations, we invite everyone to consider being intentional about the language that we use. Words do have power and we do want to be putting people first. We want to be using language that is respectful, inclusive, and welcoming to everyone within the frame of our learning community today. Everybody is welcome in this conversation and welcome to participate in this particular conversation. PowerPoint and I both reiterate how welcome you are. There will be, as I said, a brief evaluation at the conclusion of our conversation. I'm hopeful that all 81 of you now will complete that evaluation. If you have not yet done so, I think this is gonna be the last time I'll say it. It also says it on the slide. If you haven't done so yet, please type your full name into the chat and the names of anybody you may be sharing your computer with. I don't mind being interrupted. You can interrupt me at any point during our conversation. So if you want to add something, if you want to share a reaction, a thought, information, just unmute and do so. What I would ask, though, is if somebody else has the floor, if Carolyn has the floor and she's making a point, I'm going to ask that nobody else in the learning community interrupt her or anybody else. Let's give each other the respect of listening and allowing folks to finish their point if they have a point that they'd like to make. If you want to share a different perspective, a different bit of information, a, a different reaction or point, you're more than welcome to, but please let other people finish. So the bottom line, feel free to interrupt me. Please don't interrupt each other and everyone is welcome to participate in the conversation. In regard to the listen and respect, 
this is a learning community conversation. Having a different experience or point of view is a, a benefit. It is a um, it is a strength. So we don't all have to land on the same page. We can have different ideas, different opinions, different thoughts about this. What I would ask though is if you do hear something that you particularly don't agree with or don't share the same opinion with, give the individual the respect of letting them make their point. And if you'd like to share an alternate perspective or a different perspective or a different reaction, this is a learning community that is acceptable, invited, and welcome here. And then the last piece that I'll ask is that as we engage in this learning community conversation, if we can make I statements, I know this, I believe this, uh, I value this, as opposed to, well, every person who does this work or all peer educators or all counselors, if we could make I statements. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a moment. Um, Excellent. Not, not a problem. That, thank you for reminding me of that, John, and that's perfectly okay. Um, by all means, adjust your camera as you see fit. It's fantastic. I, again, I want to make sure that you, max, you maximize your experience in the learning community. So by all means, um, and thanks for reminding me. So what I am going to do, folks, is I'm going to advance the slide and before I let, give you a chance to read that, unless you're a speed reader, oh, which you may have been a speed reader there, I'm going to ask, can everybody agree to those particular guidelines? Can, can we, you can wave, you can nod, you can give a thumbs up, you can throw money as some people like to do, um, whatever works best for you. Excellent. Thank you, Tammy. Wonderful. Um, agreed. Thank you, Alexander. Fantastic. Okay, good. So those are our, thank you, Chelsea. So those are our guidelines. Those are, that's how we're going to agree to uh, interact with each other or to put it another way. That's the way we're going to roll as we participate in this learning community conversation. Fantastic. Excellent. I'm going to go back to my screen for just a moment. And again, I want to underline the goal of this learning community conversation because it is this topic of professional boundaries, that this is a revisiting or a remembering opportunity. And again, the unique twist is that it's within this informed learning community conversation. And that is what adds to something that hopefully we revisit on a regular basis. And I want to come back to that in just a minute. So I'd like you to be thinking about the revisiting nature of this topic. But what I'd like to throw out is this is what our agenda is going to touch on for today before we get to uh, defining professional boundaries. So these four points will be some of the components of what we're going to touch on in terms of our agenda or the learning objectives for today. Excellent. Breno, fantastic. That is the that is the closest to hard currency that anyone has ever thrown, other than when I was in person and they actually did throw coins. Um, but thank you so much. Excellent. Uh fantastic. That 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 is memorable. <laughs> thank you for that. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute, and I want to pose a question. And anyone who'd like to unmute, or you're more than welcome to put this in the uh, in the chat, but I, I want to pose a question, because I think it's an important question to start with as we go into this particular topic. And uh, again, let me pose the question, and you can decide if you want to unmute or not. And Carolyn, I'm kind of thinking of, of your smile when I said that this is something that, you know, we annually or maybe even more than annually revisit. And I guess the question I want to throw out and whoever wants to unmute and respond to this and anyone who wants to participate in the chat. But the question is, is if you were going to identify the top three reasons to review to revisit professional boundaries on an annual basis or biannual basis, in, based on your knowledge and your experience, what would you say 
were the top three reasons to revisit this particular topic. And I want to open that up to anybody who wants to unmute or put it in the chat. But I'm going to ask everybody to consider it. I'm going to ask all 80 plus of you to consider it. What are the top, th again, I can see Carolyn's thinking about it right now. Um, Carolyn, don't play poker. Um, <laughs> so so I'm, I'm wondering what, who, who would be willing to start us off and unmute, and, unmute um, and give us what you say were your top three reasons of why we revisit this topic on an annual basis or a biannual basis. What do you think? What are your thoughts about that? I have one. Go right ahead, Queen, please. Go ahead. Just a reminder, maybe? Yeah. Just simply, keeping it really simple, just a reminder. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Any any other thoughts? Anyone else on mute? And I see a number of people are putting things in the chat, which is fantastic. And I'm going to look at those, and I'm going to ask everybody else to look at them. Oh, is the yeah, go ahead, Carmen. What do you think? I no, think for Carolyn. me, it would be to, hold on, I'm trying to see how I can put this. Yeah, Professional boundaries help you, I guess, stay within your comfort zone and like not step on someone else's toes because we like, I work with a lot of other clinicians as well. And sometimes there has to be that professional boundary yeah. and that mutual respect um i don't know if that's part of it but yeah hey if it's part of it for you it's part of it so this this mutual respect and making sure that we're not stepping on other people's toes the other folks our colleagues that we're working at and thank you for adding that carmen go ahead carolyn what do you think um well i think as as both ladies said earlier yeah remind ourselves and uh, also in working with others, our peers. And one of the other things is with new technology and yeah. the way we interact with clients sometimes, mm -hmm. we have to continue to be reminded of the boundaries that have mm -hmm. been established because the the technology changes. Yeah. And we may be doing virtual or we may be doing uh, yep. by telephone the yep. boundaries remain the same. Yeah. Yeah. The technology changes, but the boundaries remain the same. And Carolyn, I'm going to throw this out before we go to Letitia, because Letitia, I saw that you had your hand up and, and hopefully you haven't changed your mind. But mm -hmm. Carolyn, I'm going to I'm going to throw this out and tell me if you have any thought about this, that that the technology. If we're not revisiting this can also blur or obscure the boundaries. Is that fair or am I making up too much of it? Absolutely, absolutely. It could. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you for confirming that. Letitia, what were you going to add? Hi, I just wanted to add that I agree with what everyone said. And yeah. yes, the boundaries between me and my colleagues and the boundaries between me and the clients that I do work with. Yes, definitely. Need, yeah. to, be, you know, need to be reminded. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Letitia. And, you know, I want to I want to connect something that you said and everybody else is saying. And Carmen especially identified this. And then we're going to go to Michael. And Michael, hopefully your microphone is working. Um, is that um, I love the fact that both Carmen and you expressly started with professional boundaries between colleagues. And I really want to underline that, folks, because that sometimes gets left out of this conversation where the focus usually lands is professional boundaries between the patient or the client and the worker and the and the colleague part of it gets left out so i really want to thank you for putting that on the table because that's part of the environment that need we need to be reminded of as well so so thank you for putting that on the table. Michael, the floor is yours, and then we're going to go to Vanessa. Uh, yes, uh, I, I totally agree uh, with the uh, boundaries between uh, co-workers. Yes. Very, very important because I have personally experienced that before in the past. Okay. In hold, like uh, two co-workers uh, actually uh, were talking about what I did 
instead of coming to me, and then it went to the professor. It went to the director. So yeah. when I, so when the director told me and I explained that thing to the to the to the director, I said like, oh, that's not what I was told. And I said, oh, that's what happened. So why did they tell you something different? Right. So and also need that code of ethics also talk about that. The respect, yes. mutual respect among co-workers, very, very important. Yes. And then I wanted to add one more thing. Go ahead. Uh, professional boundaries are very complex. Sometimes we may think that it is okay, but when we meet every year or every other year, people can share the experience and say, oh, I didn't even think about that. I didn't even know that that is against the boundaries. So it's very important that from time to time we need to remind ourselves. Yes. Thank you. And and I want to build on what Michael just, Vanessa, don't lose your thought. Okay. Please don't lose your thought. I want to build on what Michael said, because I want to underline, and I love the way you put it, Michael, that professional boundaries are very complex and we might have blind spots. Michael didn't use this word, but you kind of implied it, Michael, the idea that we may have blind spots and we might've been like, oh, well, I never thought about that in terms of professional boundaries, because in our setting, that's, it's different. So the fact that we come together, hopefully on at least at minimum on an annual basis, or maybe on a biannual basis, where we can kind of come together. And as Michael said, talk about our unique experiences and our unique settings. And Michael, thank you for sharing the scenario about the, the, communication problem in regard to two colleagues talking together, speaking to the director and not kind of involving you in that loop. Because again, professional boundaries involve effective and respectful communication. Another component to keep in mind. Vanessa, the floor is yours. Thank, thanks for your patience. Vanessa's on muting. There you go. Thanks. Um, yeah, similar to what Michael was speaking to, I think it's really um, important to recognize like just how inherently, you know, there's a slippery slope um, aspect to caring relationships. And something that I think about and reflect on a lot is just the importance of informed consent, especially when it comes to, you know, uh, service participants really understanding your scope of practice and what they can expect from you. And I'm just so keen to learn more skills around how to communicate that because, you know, sometimes, yeah, when you have those trusting relationships, what they expect from you kind of can metamorphosize <laughs> and that's a tricky thing. Yeah. And Vanessa, you didn't, you didn't use this phrase, but I want to throw this phrase out and then we're going to go to Chelsea and tell me if I'm, if I'm hearing this correctly from what you said, Sure, you're talking about setting and maintaining boundaries. Yeah. Is that, did I, am I hearing that? Yeah, correctly? maybe I just spoke to. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you, yeah. you definitely implied that, but that's really what you're, what you're saying is that like, we need to set these boundaries and then we need to maintain them because you described that like slippery slope or that erosion of expectation. Yeah. Or, you know, people, when they don't have other places to turn, maybe they'll turn to who they trust and that can sometimes create, yeah, that slippery slope situation. So I just, I just reflect a lot on, um, yeah, informed consent going into um, therapeutic relationships yeah. and just making sure they know exactly where things need to like stop, I guess. Yeah. And, and if it's okay, can I just make a, ask a quick follow-up question before we sure. go to Chelsea? Would that be all right? Okay. So would it be fair to say, cause I love the fact that you're, you're referencing informed consent. Mm -hmm. which means that like there's been clear there's been clear conversation about that this is this is what the scope of services are these are the limits this is yeah. the whatever is it fair to say vanessa and and i and again i don't want to put words into your mouth but is it is it fair to say that you can go through the process of informed consent with somebody and that in and of itself is no guarantee of slippery slope yeah, absolutely. And so I just want to make sure I'm doing my due diligence to the utmost, you know, level because 
Yeah. Just, especially in the context where I work, it's, um, yeah, I just see a lot of folks who yet yeah, aren't seeking supports for whatever reason, um, elsewhere. And then yeah. anyway, I'm not going to take too much time here, but yeah, you get it. Okay. Okay. Good, 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 good. And you know, I'll, I'll just add, and, and I hope that Chelsea will forgive me, but I will just add that it, you really took me back to a social service. I mentioned to you that I used to provide direct services to people living with HIV and AIDS hmm. from 1991 to 2003. And I remember being in situations where I was providing direct care, hmm. individual counseling sessions, and somehow because I was present because I was kind, because I listened to what the person had to say, the next logical jump for the patient or the client was that, well, then why wouldn't we go out on a date? Mm. And, and I don't know if anybody else has ever had that experience, but I had to be very clear that that was not the nature of the relationship. Am I am I hitting a, a resonant? That's note? a whole other thing. That yes, that's very relevant. Um, yeah, I think it's just so important to have um, like even written c- clear things to point to, and I'm just trying to develop that for yeah myself and my colleagues in the space, the unique space that we operate in. So fantastic! Thank you. Thanks so much, yes. Vanessa. Chelsea, thank you. Floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to to share really quickly. Yeah. <clears throat> I wanted to say it one of the main reasons, one of the biggest reasons for me is self-care. It's it's part of self-care. I mean, I, I've led groups where um, you know, the peers have talked about trauma and I, it comes to a point where I say, can you talk about this in detail with your with your specific therapist or peer? and not in group settings and so it's not only self-care for me but it's also you know care for the clients in the groups and also another big thing that goes along with self-care and boundaries is is prevent prevention of compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma absolutely those two things if you prevent them can can help you like maintain that that distance but still caring about the the peer of the client yeah and chelsea would it be fair to say that if you're not keeping an eye on self-care and wellness that it can have an impact on how capable you are of setting and maintaining professional boundaries absolutely it could lead to burnout yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So 24 people um, uh, noted different things in the chat. Not not a, a, a problem. Um, and thank you. I'm so glad you're here. And just make sure that your full name is in the chat. That's, that's great. Um, Dwayne wrote, uh, Conscious practice of responding to the boundaries of others and enhancement of current knowledge of current practices in the area. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, Safety for the clients, uh, safety and accountability to remain self-aware. Reminders help everybody. The overarching need to stay ethical. It can also impact the trust between employees, clients, and even the public with the field or the profession. Absolutely, Amanda. Absolutely. Uh, Sometimes coworkers expect social workers on staff to play HR, which is an unrealistic expectation because that's not their that's not their role. Uh, Excellent and perfect. All right. So, folks, uh, again where you're clearly making strong arguments as to why there are benefits to revisiting professional boundaries. And I guess I'm going to ask, and and this is kind of a, 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 a I think a next step, but if I'm going to frame it this way, if you were asked by a coworker who was new to the profession 
So someone who, let's say, just graduated from uh, their training program, whatever their training program may be, and they they had they have been in school and they're coming into the profession and they're actually providing direct services. If you, if if they said to you, you know, you know, we studied professional boundaries, we taught boundaries. What does that really mean in doing the work? If you were going to define professional boundaries for people and you wanted them to have an understanding of what that really meant in terms of how they were going to interact, actually doing the work, how would you define professional boundaries for them? And does anybody have a thought about how you would define it? If you were going to define it, what are professional boundaries? What do you think? I think it could potentially be having that mutual respect to allow the other person to be themselves to a certain aspect. Okay. Um, and then making sure that you know that that specific relationship cannot go further than what it's supposed to be because okay. then it would cause some sort of damage somewhere. Okay. So setting limits, preventing damage. Okay. And a couple of people are putting things in the chat. Let's read them. Um, guides to keep you and your patients safe what you are comfortable with, mutual informed consent as uh, to the lineation of the relationship. Yep. Okay. Uh, guidelines for what is and isn't okay or responsible in our working relationships with clients, coworkers, and community. Oh, and Julie says, thank you for that. I am a student. Excellent. Um, the evolving protections you set for yourself and others to keep you safe and ethical in coming back to work tomorrow. Wow, Lee, thank you for making that really, because again, you, the worker needs to be safe too. Um, use of professional, per, use of personal disclosure. If it's not helpful to the therapeutic relationship, don't share it. Yeah, so, so a professional boundary could be very connected to personal disclosure, uh, to not become a, a personal relationship, explaining confidentiality and safety. I believe it is a form of protection for both the client and the employee. Understood, Breno. Uh, personal disclosure, what is or is not appropriate, building healthy therapeutic relationships, not sharing personal information and staying within the bounds of ethics. Yes. Now, that's We've heard that word ethics brought to the table a few times. And I'm wondering if anybody wants to comment, quote unquote, there's a slide that's going to say later, like, well, what are ethics? But I, 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 since it's been brought to the table, what are your thoughts about ethics? What are ethics? Because we're talking about boundaries. Go ahead, Carmen. What, would you, what were you going to say about ethics? What are ethics? So when I first started the whole LMSW program, I had no idea what the heck ethics were. And I'm okay. sitting here like, okay, you got this big book with a whole bunch of ethics and guidelines. And I'm like, okay, this is way too much. But then as I started going through the field and encountering different situations with the clients, yes. it is understandable why these ethics are there. So it's pretty much like a Bible for social workers in order to help you maintain that boundary with different case scenarios. So I would say it's the Bible for social workers um, for any okay. sort of criteria or situation. It's literally right there. Like I thought people were just making things up and it's not, it's, it's literally the Bible for social workers. Right. It Excellent. Thank you. And we're going to look at what people are putting in the chats too. Um, okay. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Ethics. What would you say they maintain integrity? Absolutely. 100% true. 
But anything else you'd say about ethics? Eth ethics, Tammy says ethics are standards of practice. I think I heard somebody unmute. Go ahead. Ah, not a problem, Alexandra. So I would say guidelines set to keep everybody in their lane. Because when you cross that border, that's when you have some serious. Yeah, so they help keep Jeez. people in their lane. Mm -hmm. In their lanes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And they also express values Value. for a particular profession. Mm -hmm. Carmen mentioned social workers, which is also my code of ethics, the mm -hmm. NASW code of ethics. Mm -hmm. And different professions have different codes of ethics. Yes. I'm going to throw one out that's very familiar, and I'm wondering if anybody has any sense of which code of ethics this comes from, do no harm. Yes. Have yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty, pretty familiar, pretty right? Fun. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Bonnie, I'm wondering, is there a particular code of ethics that you ascribe to or that guides your interactions? I'm still kind of learning about everything. I'm I'm new to case management. Um, Fantastic. I'm, I'm so glad you're here. Learning my professional boundaries. Um, yeah. A lot of a lot a lot of my patients, because we have cell phones, think it's okay to text me whenever they feel like it um, on the work phone. You know, and uh -huh. I'm, I'm currently working on those professional boundaries myself. Is what is appropriate contact and what is not. Yeah. Um, that that seems to be where I struggle with with this is trying yes. to do in a polite manner the business hours are business hours and weekends are not. <laughs> yep. And and you know, Bonnie, thank you so much for saying that because there's something I want to underline in terms of what you said. And I hope it's something that we're all considering joining you in, which is you said, I'm struggling with that. And I think one of the things about ethics is that they guide us and we always have to be kind of reflecting on them and revisiting them and considering them. And I love the fact that you framed it that way, because what that tells me is that you're trying to figure out what's best for the patients and the clients mm -hmm. and what's best for the work. Mm -hmm. And what's best for you as the professional. Correct. Correct. And not every patient I can approach in the same manner. Of course not. Of so course. it's learning that, that fine line. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I, and I want to come back to the example that Bonnie's bringing because a couple of people registered some thoughts or reactions in the chat. And I don't know if you saw that, Bonnie, but you might, you might want to take a look, but I want to bring it back to a conversation to the whole learning community because I love your example. And it's related to what Carolyn was saying about technology, because Carolyn, I don't know about you, but I remember a time before the cell phone. <laughs> I mean, and it, and you and I may be the only people who remember that time in our learning community, but uh, Dawn remembers it too. I remember a time before the cell phone and texting wasn't even an issue that had to be considered. So Elizabeth, before you jump in, I just want to acknowledge Chelsea. And then if you want to jump in and make a comment, please do. Go ahead, Chelsea, the floor is yours. And then we'll go right to Elizabeth. Can you hear me? Sorry, there's like a yeah, there's a lot more you. outside. Yeah. Anyway, I I just want to mention the when the person before me mentioned that you know the technology and everything and boundaries. I was just I, I thought back to when I was a client at a partial care program, and I I had called the clinician outside of office hours on her cell phone, and the next day she said, you know I I'm not available after five. So I, I just want to mention that with boundaries, I found that it's, you know, myself too, um, that it's important that the boundaries are consistent across people yep. as well as early on. You, yep. you have to set the boundaries early on 
and they have to be consistent across all your peers or all your clients or it also won't work because somebody yep. will be like hey you took their phone you took their phone call at six o'clock last night but you won't take my my phone call at, that's right yeah so you have to be consistent across every everyone you work with that's right. And consistency as well as setting them early. And I'm thinking of Vanessa, what Vanessa said, because we lay the foundation and then we we work collaboratively to keep the foundation in place. And, and, and Elizabeth, don't lose your thought. I want to go back to something that Chelsea said, because Chelsea, thank you for disclosing that as a client, you took a particular action and then you and the worker had a conversation about the boundary that's in place. I want to underline something here. When a client reaches out, it's not because they're a bad client and it's not because they're trying to be disrespectful necessarily. It's because they may be in need. And and that doesn't mean we still don't keep to our ethics. That doesn't mean we still aren't clear about the boundaries. But we also have to be very clear about the fact that we can't expect clients are not bound by codes of ethics. They are bound maybe by patient agreements or client agreements in order to receive services. But that is not the same thing as codes of ethics. So we can't have that same expectation. And, and I love Chelsea's example. And thank you for sharing it, Chelsea, because you're now on both sides. You, you've experienced it from the client's perspective, and you also experience it from the worker's perspective. And what I'm hopeful is that when we need to do the work that Vanessa described, we'll do that in a respectful, compassionate, collaborative way so that we build trust and partnership as opposed to making people feel bad or shamed. So I with just my, wanted to, yeah, go ahead, Chelsea. With my old peers, with my own peers, I've learned to give them a list of all the different war lines and hotlines that they can call at any time of the day. Fantastic. Fantastic. So you're also providing additional resources where people, and again, relates to what Vanessa said, because it can be very easy. If I'm working with Vanessa and I really like Vanessa and I feel like I have a connection with Vanessa, why would I want to go anywhere else? And again, we're not trying to make clients dependent upon us. And that's maintaining that professional boundary. Elizabeth, I thank you so much for your patience. Go right ahead. It's no problem. I, a lot of what I was going to say was already said, um, but I do say it up front with clients about their bound, the boundaries of therapy, counseling, um, their treatment while they're with me. Um, and I'll let them know if I cannot get back to you within two hours, within normal business hours, which is close of day is five o'clock. Yep. I will get back to you within 24 hours if it's not the weekend. If there's an emergency, you need to call 911. Fantastic. So again, you're laying it out there. You're laying the limitations out there. You're mm -hmm. laying the boundaries out there. And, and, and similar to what Chelsea's saying, you're also providing with additional resources if they're in need when you're not mm -hmm. available. Right. now. And, so my business line is a Google number. Yep. And so it, within settings of Google, I do put on the do not disturb after a certain time. So they can call, they can leave a message, they can text. It'll yeah. be there, but they're right. not necessarily going to get a response. And even sometimes I have to catch myself if I need jerk reaction, want to respond because I'm like, oh, that's, you know, I have a response for them. But I just make a note of it. And so that when it's normal yeah. business time, I then respond. Understood. So Elizabeth, you're also acknowledging that for you, sometimes you're tempted to break your own boundary because you want to be responsive and you remind yourself, no, this is the boundary that I set. Yeah. They have other resources. Right. And, you know, I want to acknowledge something here. And, and I don't know if you experienced this, Elizabeth, but I can tell you with myself, I have experienced this. And if, and if you have, you know, maybe you'll <laughs> say sometimes it's really hard to maintain those boundaries because we do care and we mm -hmm. want to help. Yeah. And I am thinking of the language that Vanessa used because it's so powerful. That can become a slippery slope, mm -hmm. which is not good for the client. 
and is not good for us. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I really appreciate your example. Thanks for sharing that, Elizabeth. All right. So folks, I'm going to share my screen again. And we have moved far beyond the agenda, which is fantastic and not unexpected. And, and, and again, I, I want to just underline this idea. And we've talked about this, what ethics mean, but this idea that they are codes that guide our actions on and off the job. And, and I will say, because I'm bound by the social work code of ethics, I will say that I am a social worker, even when I am not, uh, you know, providing direct services between the hours of X and X. And I want to give a concrete example of that, which is that I'm a mandated reporter because of my license. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in a situation where I observe what might be a situation where behavior needs to be reported, even if I'm not at work, my code of ethics requires me to make that report. And that's the code of ethics that frames my profession. So what I would ask everybody to consider is we have our code codes of ethics in regard to what professions we may be in. We also have our policy and procedures that are related to the programs or organizations that we work out of. And we also have our personal values, beliefs, and boundaries as well. So a couple of things coming into the chat. Ethics, Carmen says, ethics allow professionals to be separated from the community uh, that are trained to respond even not at work. Yes. Uh, Alexandria wrote, uh, same, it depends. If it is the middle of the night, most likely I won't even be awake to answer. But if it's 7 a.m., I need to pick up the phone, call. I'm able to flex my time. Or if my conversation goes past five, I can go in later. I know not everyone is able to do that in their place of employment. And thanks for adding that. Um, also, guidelines set forth that create boundaries to protect all parties involved. Yes. Again, keep in mind, folks, that within certain settings, within certain organizations, it, it does, there are differences. And professions are sort of parametered by particular codes or canons of ethics. Thanks for letting me know, uh, Josh. Uh, yes, Terry says, ethics are codes to live your life by professional and personal. Yep, absolutely. All right, I'm gonna share my screen again. And boundaries. So we know that ethics are specific codes of behavior. Boundaries we know are based kind of on job expectations, policies and procedures, programs, personal values and choices. And, and in some ways there are, there are differences between ethics and boundaries. And one of the things that I would throw out for us to consider is ethics are kind of the broader strokes and the boundaries are kind of how things play out in specific situations and they are interrelated. Also, I'm gonna share sort of some of the purposes that they serve. And I'm very curious as you look at these, and I'm gonna ask anybody to comment either in the chat or to unmute, but which one of these jumps out at you most? And you can type the number in the chat or you can unmute and comment. But as you look at these, which one of these jumps out to you most? And I'm going to go back so you can see all seven. So I'm going to ask everybody to take a look at these quickly and just identify. And if you want to unmute and say that, you know, number four jumps out to me most, but say, say a little bit about why you feel that one jumps out to you most. So, so far people are acknowledging two, four, two, five, two, 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 four. 
A lot of twos, four and six. Yes. So any, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen, um, but again, please look at these seven and identify the one that jumps out to you most. And I'm going to just randomly invite Tammy, if it's okay, can I, can I invite you to comment on which one of those maybe jumped out to you most? Tammy Krep, if you, if you're able to unmute, would you be willing to comment on that? You can pass if you would rather not, but if, if you're willing, I'd love to hear which one and why. Yeah, so number two stuck out to me, um, boundaries. Um, I find that boundaries are both a protection and inform both the client and myself. Okay, because they are a protection and they give information to both of you, client and yourself. Fantastic. Shannon, any, any thought? Kate, would you be willing? Are you willing to tell us which one and why? Are you afraid of me? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, number two as well. Um, okay. I love people chose number two. I think it protects both um, yeah. professional and the, and the clients as well. So that is important. Okay. okay, fantastic. And you know, you, you and Tammy both lead me to want to ask one fine follow-up question, which is, is there anybody that didn't pick number two? And if you didn't pick number two, which one did you pick and why? Why did you pick that one if it wasn't number two? So anybody who didn't pick number two want to unmute and tell us why you picked that one and and, and why? So Carmen Hi, here, Mark. I picked up yeah. number four. Um, it helps develop trusting relationships. I actually dealt with a client who was arrested. So, you know, as a clinician on the field, I'm supposed to help advocate for him. Um, he did not like what the judge said. And I turned around and I said, we might not like what she said, but we still have to follow through in order to make sure that we're all safe. He cursed me out. So I said, okay, well, if you're gonna curse me out, I'm not gonna be able to help you because we need to have that respect for each other. Mm. He apologized, he said, you know what? You're right, I messed up. You're trying to help me out, I'm sorry. And he did, he apologized. Wow. Um, but now everything is going well. He's fully connected to services and he's doing much better. Okay. So the fact that you set a boundary with him helped him to reflect on his behavior and helped him to make a decision that he was going to work with you as opposed to curse you out. Fantastic. Fantastic. Is there anyone else in our learning community of 91 people that did not pick number two that would be willing to unmute and tell us, and it's okay if you did pick number two, by the way, that's fantastic if that's the one that resonated for you, but is there anybody else who didn't pick number two who'd be willing to unmute and tell us which one you picked and, and why you picked it that wasn't number two? Hi, Courtney. Go ahead. Hi. So I also picked number four because the way that we work with either pro other professionals, our clients, our patients, any of those relationships, boundaries set the tone for how we're going to communicate with them and build trust with them and other people. And when you don't have trust or when you don't have the ability to set your boundaries and teach people how to talk to you or what yeah. your expectation is for conversation or yeah. interactions, um, it creates a situation that nobody wants to really participate in. Um, so I think that boundaries yeah, help true. create a trusting relationship. So they understand what your consistency is, mm -hmm. um, and what they can expect from you, but also what you can expect from them maintaining those boundaries. Um, yeah. and also that you can reset them a lot of different, uh, situations can arise where we have to reset our boundaries and say, hold on, this is outside of the boundaries. I know we haven't come across this yet, but yep. this is a boundary for me. And yep. most people, I would say most, I enjoy having boundaries with, uh, when people have to set boundaries with me. So I know where they are. I like right. that. I enjoy a person that has very clear boundaries because I know, okay, this is where we're at. And this is the conversation we can have. These right. are the things that we can discuss. It's it's yep. kind of 
it kind of takes away all of the anxiety or any of the other things yep. that come along with that. So I imagine it's the same for others. I don't know about everybody's experience, but I imagine yep. it's the same for others. I enjoy having a person who will set clear boundaries with me. So I tried to, if you will, give that gift <laughs> by setting clear boundaries with others for that trusting relationship. Yeah, you're really acknowledging, Courtney, that somehow those clear boundaries decrease your anxiety. They let yeah. you know where you stand. Yeah. And I love that you said, too, that sometimes boundaries have to be reset or renegotiated mm -hmm. because you'll come across a moment or a situation that you hadn't anticipated. Absolutely. You hadn't planned. So boundaries are not, they're, they're not dead. They're very, no. uh, fluid, They're very organic, very, very organic and very yeah. dynamic and alive. Yes. I Thank agree. you. Th thanks for putting that on the table, Courtney. We're going to go to Michael and then to Taylor sky. And then I wasn't sure there, I think there might've been somebody else who unmuted, who wanted to say something and we'll let them if they want to, but we'll go to Michael and then we'll go to Taylor sky. Go ahead, Michael. Yes, so uh, I believe all the uh, seven, one to seven is good, it's great, but I pick number seven. Okay. For a reason. Which one? We need, to, we, we need to separate work from home. If we don't draw that boundary, we are going to be quickly burned out and it's not going to be good for our sanity. We are going to make a mistake. And when it comes to uh, uh, making decisions, we are going to yeah. get it wrong. I say this for a reason. You know, I work in a crisis unit because of short staffing. About 10 people have left our facility and workload has increased. So mm -hmm. what I saw is that many of us were people were actually going in on their days off to complete the paperwork with that compensation. So if you don't draw that line, so sometimes at, 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 at a point came that all of us were so exhausted, people were filing for like FMLA, FMLA something like that. Family yeah, medical leave, yep. Yeah. yeah, but it can just to take like three months or one month off to reset. Right. So eventually I have to learn that, you know what, boundaries is very important. You have to know when it's time for me to go home, I'll yes. give them an hour free time. It's okay because they gave me a job to do. So I give them one hour. After that, I, I switch off my work cell phone. Yep. Yep. And again, that's setting and maintaining a boundary. Excellent. Thanks for letting me know, Queen. Go ahead, Taylor Sky. The floor is yours. Um, I was just going to say that I also picked number four and seven um, for the fact that um, when you are setting boundaries, um, you're telling your client like what to expect right away. So they're not trying to negotiate with you like um, throughout the process. And if and when something does happen and it might not be the most ideal situation, like they know what to expect coming forward. Um, at the same time, I like have to put those boundaries at like home and work with my schedule. We're allowed to work with pretty flexible hours, and yeah. and so it's sometimes hard to like turn off my brain and say like the client is not my sister, for example. Like, and it's very easy to like get that confused. And so like sometimes I do need that brief moment to just yep. disconnect. Yep. Work. Yeah, and it's a great example of the boundary between work and home really protecting you against that kind of confusion. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you 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 prompt me to want to add one other thing, and then we're going to move forward, which is we're the employee. We're the professional. We're the ones who are responsible for the boundaries, for carrying out the ethics. The clients and the patients, as I said earlier, they're not bound. They're, they don't have to follow those because it's not their profession. And, it, and hopefully I, I'm not going out on too far of a limb here. Is it fair to say that sometimes patients and clients don't have very positive experiences of having their boundaries respected. So therefore, they may not really respect boundaries 
And this is where the resetting, being clear, revisiting. And it's only because they don't have the experience of being able to set a boundary and have their boundary respected as well. Is that, have I gone too far by saying that? Or, or do you think that that's, a, that's, Carolyn, you would agree? Okay, okay, Alexander, you agree? Okay, all right. I just, I just wanted to put that on the table because sometimes it can be frustrating Okay, so Dwayne also agrees. Okay, thank you, Dwayne. Good. All right. I, I just wanted to put that out on the table and, and get a sense of. Carolyn, did you want to comment on that? Go ahead, please. Just to add to it a little bit, and speaking, I, because I relate to what Michael said about home and and the job and separating the two. Yeah. And going in and actually doing work that may have because of the number of people that have left the professional, left that particular site. Yep. And that there is so much work to do that you go in to yeah. get some of that work done, hopefully to give you a good weekend. And also so that when you come in on that Monday, that you come in with a clean slate sort of. Yeah. Yep. However, in setting in, 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 breaking your own boundaries now mm -hmm. there is you know i your employer we're the employee but the employer also has a responsibility in that and they tend to kind of close their eyes to that whole thing so again um just throwing it out it's something that we as yep. as individuals as the responsible professional as yep. the caregiver, because we are yes. caring and compassionate, that we also have to care for ourselves and and act and absolutely that's a that's a very important. That's one of Ag the priorities. Agreed. And you know, as you were saying what you were saying, Carolyn, Elizabeth wrote in, in the chat, I don't know if you saw it, but she wrote in the chat that it can almost become an expectation then yes. that staff is going to do that. And 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 I'm thinking of what Vanessa said because Vanessa put this language on the table. Vanessa, another example of a slippery slope. And it's not a slippery slope with the patient or the client. It's a slippery slope between ourselves and the organization. And and professional boundaries can protect us there as well. I'm going to give the floor to Michael and then we're going to go forward a little bit. Go ahead, Michael, the floor is yours. Yes, I, I want to add this quickly. You Please. See, I like the expectation because once people use their days off to keep up catching up on the work without compensation, those who have other commitment, like they have children, they have second job, they are not able to do that, it creates confusion at work. So now when it comes to evaluation, the question is asked, how come these people are able to finish their work on time and these people are not able to complete their time, their work on time? And it also allows the uh, the employer to just not hire anybody. If two people can do 10 people's work, why hire more people, more staff? So it can create a lot of confusion. I think that all of us should be able to, number seven, I like number seven that, that much. In the past, I wasn't doing it. But now, <laughs> I, I'm part, I want to make sure that I stick to it. And uh, when I started doing that, I have some peace. I'm not as drained as before. I'm not exhausted driving home. So I think yeah. it's something to consider. Fantastic. Fantastic, Michael. And, and, and I just want to say, I think Michael makes a very convincing case for number seven. <laughs> So, and, and you know, Michael, the other thing I want to underline, and 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 I'm thinking of what other people have said during this learning community conversation so far, is your your passion and your commitment to number seven have come out of the assessment of your experience. And and what I want to say is that our relationship to professional boundaries evolves as we have various experiences. And sometimes we'll make a misstep. And hopefully that misstep is not seriously harmful 
to ourselves, to the patient, to the profession, to the organization, and it can be a learning opportunity. And again, that's one of the benefits of revisiting this as a learning community on an annual or biannual basis, because it's, it's, it is truly a reminder and I can profit from Michael's experience, even if I haven't been there. I can profit by that slippery slope that Vanessa has introduced into the conversation. I may not have experienced it because Vanessa is mindful of it, because she shared her experience about it. I can be maybe better prepared if I start to head in that particular direction. So again, I want to thank you all for what you're what you're putting on the table in terms of your your real experience. I'm going to share my screen again. I'm just going to quickly check. Um, Linda wrote, "When I when a misstep is made, we need to revisit our agreement with the patient and also acknowledgement." Absolutely. Thank you for letting me know, Phyllis. Excellent. All right, I'm going to share my screen again. So, you know, I think this, a picture sometimes is worth a thousand words. And this whole idea, if you can't see this picture really well, I want to describe it to you, which is, or if you can't see this picture at all, I certainly want to describe it to you, which is the idea that, you know, if we're not maintaining and revisiting and resetting and possibly renegotiating our professional boundaries, we are potentially on thin ice. And this is a picture of some, sketchy looking ice with a caution danger ahead sign that we we really could be um, moving into a situation where perhaps some harm could occur to us. And again, I, I really appreciate Michael's commitment to number seven in terms of making sure that we stay compassionate, able to do our work, not burnt out. And that's that's part of our professional boundaries as well. Excellent. Thanks for letting me know, Phyllis. Welcome back. So the importance of boundaries, i.e. the professional, it's clear, and I've said this already, but here's a slide that reinforces it. We are responsible as the professional for establishing and maintaining the boundaries with our colleagues, with ourselves, and with our clients and patients. Because we're the professional, and, and, and let me be very clear when I say professionals, I mean people providing care or services, which could be peer educators, peer counselors, that all falls under the heading of the professional. We're in a position of power, and we need to be aware of that, and we need to be using and wielding that power in a professional way. And of course, we want to make sure that we're not abusing that position of power by crossing boundaries. And, and again, we're responsible for maintaining the boundary, not the client or the patient. Again, that's not any license for bad or disrespectful or violent or abusive behavior at all. That's clearly a breach of conduct on the patient's part. And we can't expect that the client or the patient is going to ascribe, quote unquote, to professional boundaries. That's, that is our responsibility. All for the reason of maintaining healthy, trusting professional relationships. Again, with our colleagues, with clients and patients. Excuse me, and also, so that patients can have healthy, trusting relationships with the profession as a whole. We should, again, be responsible for setting and maintaining those boundaries, not exploit any trust relationships with clients, not enter into personal related relationships, dating, sexual relationships that violate professional boundaries with current clients, or someone uh, is who's a significant person in that person's life. Also, and these are some of the very bright lines. We should not make any inappropriate physical contact with clients. 
and never initiate or engage in any sexual conduct with the client. These again are very bright lines that are often spelled out in codes of ethics and in policies and procedures and may align with our personal values as well. And, and folks, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here for a moment because I want to acknowledge something. It's very easy to see all that on a slide and to be like, yes, yes, of course. I do need to acknowledge, though, that some providers do engage in romantic and sexual relationships with clients. And that is a breach of boundaries, and it creates harm on multiple fronts. Go ahead, Chelsea. I wanted to give some um, personal experience here. I had I had Please. two two peers. I'm a peer support specialist and a recovery coach. Yeah. And for one of my one of the internships I, I'm working at, they um I had one person ask me for my my personal phone number, and I said I said I'm sorry, but due to my professional boundaries I and limitations, I can't I can't give you my personal phone number. Yeah. And um, the other another person asked, invited me to their house to go like a barbecue thing. And I said, you know, again, I said to this person, I, I really appreciate you uh, inviting me. But due to personal ba professional boundaries, yeah. I, I can't, you know, um, be your friend outside of outside of the groups that you're in. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know how, how many other people have had that. It wasn't like anything sexual. It was just like friendship yep. kind of thing yeah dual um, relationships sometimes i feel like it's harder being a peer support specialist because there there's is that yes you know, honor between being a clinician and a psychiatrist yes. psychologist yeah and or a social worker and and being a peer yep yep and, and and what you're acknowledging is that there is a difference and there's nuances to that and you're also acknowledging that it, it was very clear to you that you needed to set and maintain a boundary in order to keep doing the work. And I don't know if, if people saw this. Yeah, Carolyn writes about giving gifts, absolutely. And Elizabeth acknowledges, yeah, walk. you walked in on something like that. And uh, again, it is possible that folks might think, well, why is that wrong? And, and, and again, there are some breaches of conduct that literally will cause people to lose their license and be banned from the profession. Carolyn, I see you're unmuted. Please go ahead. It was an accident, but um, the whole <laughs> idea of <laughs> a happy one, I think. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, the gift giving by clients sometimes can uh, it can be kind of like you don't know that they're even going to give you a gift. They're even bringing a gift. And yeah. um, so how do you receive it or, or just kind of refuse it without making the client feel rejected yeah. or, um, or, or kind of, you know, jeopardizing your relationship, your yeah. professional relationship with them, your therapeutic relationship with them. Yep. So um, those are things that I believe have to be talked about up front. Yep. And this is this is akin to what Bonnie brought up about texting, because because it's how do you manage? How do you navigate this in such a way that doesn't harm the connection you have with the person, but also doesn't breach the boundary or create a slippery slope of expectation. Well, I gave Carolyn a gift. So now Carolyn's going to give me, eh, you know, it's so it's going to be quid pro quo. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry, Carolyn, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Oh, that's fine. That's exactly, I'm, I'm done with that. But gift, receiving gifts from clients can become really kind of a, a real slippery slope, you know, because clients talk to each other. Yes. They sure do. <laughs> yeah. So there's yeah. no favoritism and none of that, you know, yep. offered between uh, the client base. That's it. Yeah. And and I think Carmen said this earlier about, con or it might have been 
Courtney, I'm not sure who said this, but somebody mentioned consistency. And the idea, or or it might have been even Chelsea who said this about consist. It was Chelsea about. I knew it was a C <laughs> that about consistency. And you know, the fact is, folks, there are some clients or patients that we may like more than others. And the professional boundary is that we we want to make sure that we're treating everybody with respect and that we're being consistent in what we apply across the board. Yeah, and Michael's asking, is hugging inappropriate? Sometimes people cry when they open up, and it's my natural inclination to give them a hug. Is that wrong? And you know, always might- ask, always ask. Yeah, yeah, and and I love that question. And and Chelsea is is saying always ask, and I and I can also say that myself, and I'm just be I'm making an I statement here, okay. When I'm with a client and they become emotional or they become tearful, my inclination might be to hug them. My inclination might be to ask them if I could hug them or whatever. And my boundary that I keep for myself is I don't make physical contact with clients. And it's because they may have trauma history. It might be easy for them to misunderstand my physical contact with them. And I believe it's possible for me to communicate my concern and my caring without having to physically sort of make contact with them. And and for some people, that's parametered by their program or their organization. Their organization may say, you make absolutely no physical contact with participants or clients. So again, these are wonderful areas. And Carolyn, I want to go back to something that you said, because I don't want it to get lost in the sauce. And then we're going to go to Michael. Carolyn said, and I and I heard her say this, I hope everybody else heard it when she was talking about the gifts, that we need to talk through these things in order to understand where we sit with them and how we're going to proceed in regard to them, because they are not always black and white. Boundaries are very unique. Michael, I'm going to give you the floor. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, Chelsea uh, put it in the chat that sometimes yeah. gift can, uh, uh, can also lead to obligation. And I yeah. experienced that. I remember there was one client who became very successful in treatment and yeah. uh, she he was able to find a good job uh, working in a, with a diesel, diesel uh, engines and he was making pretty good money. So yeah. because of the because of the successful outcome, the counselor decided to have a party when he was graduating and she told me about a pizza for him. And now it becomes like obligation. Now, anybody who wants to graduate, how come you did you, you you bought a party for for him when he was graduated and I can have a party? Different confusion altogether. So if you know that you are not going to be consistent, let's be careful. Yeah. If you want to start do one thing for one client, make sure you can consistently do it for everybody in similar situations. There is also the downside. If we accept get from the client, not every client is able to give. Some people don't have money. Some people have sold drugs. They swim in money. They can give. Sometimes, you know what? I can pay for this. Not everybody. You don't want to make somebody feel bad just because they are not able to also give a gift. Yes. And and I can't remember who said this, but I know somebody did say this. And it might have been you, Michael. But somebody said the complexity of this. It's complex. And... I want to go back to what Carolyn said, talking it through. One of the ways to get through the complexity of it is taking it out of just your head and sharing it with other people. It's important to address the complexity with others because alone, it's too easy to let our own blind spots or our own subjectivity sort of be in the mix. So being able to talk it through with others can be very valuable. As in this learning community. 
I'm going to share my screen again. So there are some questions that you can ask yourself. You're going to have these slides. They're there for you to look at. But are you making decisions about boundaries or lack thereof because you're uncomfortable? Are you asking, and you're asking yourself, is what I'm doing or the boundary I'm setting here or not setting here best for the client? To my point that I just made, underlining what Carolyn said earlier, have I talked to my colleagues or supervisors about this? And if I haven't, why haven't I? And am I denying my client an opportunity to grow? And am I making this decision because it's the easiest thing to do? And is this something I can negotiate with my client? Do I need to revisit the boundary? Do I need to come back to something? Do we need to negotiate something here? So I just wanted to underline these questions and make them available to you so that you can be reminded of a process that you can go through when a gray area presents itself. So again, the idea of being a professional, keeping in mind, and there's, there's, there's one word that I really want to throw out here for us to consider, and we've, we've been talking about what it is to be a professional and follow a code of ethics, establish and maintain boundaries. But there's a word that I want to throw out here, that a professional is somebody who is aware of, considering and always contemplating safety. And, and I mean that broadly. I mean safety for themselves, safety for their colleagues, and safety for the clients and the participants. Again, this idea of professionalism. I love the second part of this definition from the Social Work Dictionary. Again, that we are using our knowledge, our skills, and our qualifications around a particular profession, and we are adhering to the values and ethics of the client and the population that we're working with. Yes, and I agree with you, Phyllis, safety for all. And... Again, the idea, it's probably, you know, I should probably rewrite this question. Can you tell when someone is exhibiting being unprofessional? And the answer, of course, is absolutely you can. But also keeping in mind, what is the quote unquote professional doing that is quote unquote professional? So a couple of thoughts. About, yeah, go ahead, Michael. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Michael's unmuting, I think. Nope. Sorry, I happened by mistake. Not a problem. Not a problem. Okay, just wanted to check. All right. So, it, it is probably a good thing to care about professionalism because... A lot of the grievances, a lot of the cases that are filed are around lack of professionalism. So we can avoid litigation and it can also prevent burnout and promote mutual respect. Clients can actually be more satisfied and I will go so far as to say that they might even feel more safe because they understand the parameters and the boundaries. We ourselves, and again, I'm thinking of what Michael told us and what others told us, that uh, you might feel calmer, more satisfied, less pressured by your job. And there are probably a lot of other ones that we could spend a lot of time uh, exploring. I will throw out, though, that this is something to care about because it is going to make us better at what we do, healthier while we do what we do, and we'll be able to hopefully have better outcomes with the people we're providing care to.
as well. These are a number of things that can be considered lapses in professionalism. And what I can say in regard to these several bullets is that, and, and again, I'm thinking of what Vanessa said earlier, these can be serious slippery slopes to much more difficult problems. And, you know, Carolyn brought this up and others commented on it, but keep in mind that last, that last bullet there about gifts and the, the, the nuancing and the management and perhaps the expectations that that can set up. And we could probably spend a lot of time underlining what some of the potential impacts are of these specific lapses. But the bottom line of it is, is that they are all potential harm causers. This is just a little joke about dual relationships that we've already uh, talked about uh, in terms of the legal profession, the attorney-client relationship. Um, excellent. Thanks for letting me know, Tessa. Welcome back. And the idea of that dual relationships, when we enter into a relationship that assumes a second role with the client, we become a friend, a teacher, an associate, a family member, an employer, or a sex partner of that person. And again, the road to potential harms. Now, in some settings, it's very hard to avoid dual relationships. And I want to give a concrete example, one that um, was, was pointed out to me when working in a, a very rural uh, environment in the West, that uh, a worker actually purchased firewood because the client was the only person who provided firewood in the whole town that they lived in. So some dual relationships are difficult to avoid or negotiate. And I will bring us back to what Carolyn said earlier about if dual relationships are unavoidable and are problematic, the other thing to consider is that they need to be talked through so that we can minimize or address any harms that may come up in regard to them. And again, some of the dangers spelled out in black and white here. I think they speak for themselves. And I, I love the fact that this bullet, this last one that I brought up here says that they may be unethical. And in some cases, and one of our colleagues mentioned this earlier, they are potentially even illegal. And again, the idea that we can be friendly with our clients, but we're not our clients' friends. And, and again, as what was said earlier, depending on your role, that's a, a very nuanced boundary to keep and to maintain. Yeah, and thank you, Mallory. I, I, and I'm glad I mentioned that example in a, in a small town or in a rural environment because the dual relationships, they, they present real challenges. I, I'll give another one that comes up quite often. Some people who provide services are also people that are in recovery. And the dual relationships can spring up in large and small environments because people go to the same 12-step meetings. And again, some people talk about how if, if that's the situation, they will leave. Other people have talked about how they've negotiated that or how they change what they may talk about in a particular meeting. So the beauty of professional boundaries, of having conversations about ethics, is that we can always explore what's the best way to proceed that minimizes any kind of harm. Bonnie, thanks for letting me know. So again, being a friend is not the same thing as being someone's service provider. These are just some things to be reminded about the differences. So keeping that in mind. A couple of general guidelines. These are basic. They're not all of them. Socializing with clients outside of the workplace. Again, 
giving personal information to clients. And again, we had the great example of, no, I'm sorry, I can't give you my personal cell phone number. Participating in illegal behaviors, again, illegal, dual relationships, giving or receiving gifts, lending and borrowing, buying and selling, and friending on social media. Again, some programs are set up in such a way that peer educators, if there are peer educators providing direct services, that's they. it's part of the program that they interact on social media. But again, it's negotiating those boundaries so that everybody is able to remain safe. Vanessa, please, the floor is yours. Go right ahead. Can't hear you, Vanessa. Um, I just wanted to put that up, put something out there because I know Facebook is again slippery with how they operate sometimes. So just something to be mindful of um, is like just hiding your friend list can be really beneficial to like colleagues who might have different boundaries than you. Because like if you are a peer support worker and you do have the green light and you're comfortable being friends on Facebook, but you're also friends with other people um, that don't have that same uh, boundary, it, it that's caused me anxiety in the past. And I just wanted to put it out there. So I, I think it's something to be mindful of. Absolutely. And I just want to be clear about what you're saying, Vanessa, yeah. that you were friends with somebody else, but that person didn't hide their friends list. Therefore, you, someone could have access to you through yeah. their list. Yeah, just exactly. Okay. Like okay. I've gotten messages from people and I was like, oh my gosh, like where did that come from? And right. then I just realized, oh, you know, yep. so obviously we can't control everything, but it is something that, um, yep. Yeah. yep. And I love the fact that you said that. I'm going to repeat it. I love yeah, it so we much. Can. Obviously we can't control everything <laughs> and- we can choose, we can reflect on it and yeah. we can choose how we're going to respond that maintains boundaries and maintains respect and therapeutic alliance or connection. Yeah. Thank you. Th thanks. thanks for putting that on the table. All right. I think I saw a couple of other things. My supervisor always says, be mindful about what you post on social media because it will stay there forever and never real and is never really private. Yes. Yeah. And absolutely. H had to mention that. Had to mention that. I'm going to share my screen again. So. So, folks, this is the scenario. We have about... 17 minutes remaining. I do want us to take a moment and look at this scenario and I'm going to let the computer read it to you. But what, what I'm going to ask is I just want to get a sense of what's your reaction to this based on everything that we've talked about so far? What's your reaction to this based on everything we've talked about so far? So I'm going to let the computer read it. And then we're going to be able to have a brief conversation about it. And then I, I, I'm going to need to sort of draw our conversation to a conclusion for today. My hope is, is that we'll have opportunities to revisit professional boundaries and other topics together in the future. But I, I will need to begin to draw our conversation to a conclusion because I do want to make sure that you have time to complete the uh, evaluation. So I'm going to let the computer read this to you. You can read it yourselves, but I'm going to let the computer read it to you. And then I'm going to just ask for your initial thoughts or reactions. Here we go. Sergio was removed from his biological parents at age 10 due to abuse and neglect and lived in foster homes until his mother was able to regain custody of him when he was 15. Sergio is now a case manager at a social service agency. When he is assigned the case of Jonathan Chavez, he sees many similarities between Jonathan's history and his own. During his initial meeting with Jonathan's parents, Sergio discloses many details about his own history 
and informs the parents of the steps his mother went through, including inpatient rehab, intensive therapy, and taking psychotropic medication that helped her turn her life around. Based on what he has read in previous social worker reports, he informs Jonathan's mother that she sounds a lot like his mom and suggests that she be evaluated for psychotropic meds. So that's the scenario. And Chelsea, I wish I had a video of which you're, you're shaking your head like, oh my. So, and Tessa just wrote in the chat, it sounds like he needs to address his trauma. Okay, so Tessa, thanks hey, for, yeah, go ahead, Chelsea. Say, and then we're um, gonna go to Michael. Go ahead, the Chelsea. reason I'm so, uh, I don't agree with this at all is because he's saying, he's putting his own, he's projecting his own, his mother's experience, his own experience on this, these people, when they have completely different lives, even though there's some similarity, you can't, there's, he is pretty much saying this is the only way you can recover to this mom, where there, the client's mother may, may do, you know, something completely different and recover in that way. So I don't like that they said there's basically one way to recover. Um, even though I am a peer support specialist, I, I, you know, I've had trauma, but I don't talk personally about my trauma because with, with my peers, because okay. it's, it's just not it's not the right place. It's, and I, I try to, with my own peers, I am always like, you have your own way of recovering. You can, mm -hmm. we're here to talk about what, whatever yep. Yep. ways you want to recover and, and stuff yep. like that. I, I, yeah. I d disagreed with this thing. I, I understand. I, I understand. And, th and thank you for jumping in and saying that. Um, and, and let's just throw wow exclamation point exclamation point exclamation point it crossed a lot of boundaries and i see that dawn is unmuted i know michael and alexandria want to say something but i want to ask a poll i want to do a quick poll first because i really appreciate um what you're putting in the chats but i want to ask everybody in the learning community to weigh on this before we go to michael alexandria and then to dawn i i, I just want to ask everybody to weigh in on this do you think that this is a realistic scenario? Do you think that this could really happen? If you think it's realistic, type an R in the chat. If you think it's, unfortunately, yes, somebody put. Okay. And if you think it's unrealistic, type a U. I, I am inclined to agree with the, the, the overwhelming number of R's and yes, that it's realistic. Absolutely. So let's go to Michael. We'll go to Alexandria. We'll go to Dawn and then we'll go to Stacy. So go ahead, Michael. The floor is yours. Uh, this, as I said before, uh, this is a very complex situation we are discussing, but I like the fact that we can share ideas and see what to do and what not to do when we find ourselves in a situation like that. When I started working in this field about seven to maybe eight years ago, they yeah. taught us yeah. that self-disclosure is allowed if it will be to the benefit of the client. Okay. That is what we, we, we were taught. I don't know about other states, but I'm, for, I'm, yep. I'm, I'm from New Jersey. That is what yep. we yep. were taught when I was in school. Yep. Yep. Then at a point in time, somewhere maybe a couple of years ago, they say self-disclosure is not allowed, no matter the reason. But I didn't understand it until I found out, you see, some of these clients, they are very smart. If you are, if you work with them and you are not careful, they can knock off your feet, okay? Because sometimes yep. they may come to you. Uh, did you get high before? I work in the substance abuse field. So that's a part time. Did, did you get high before? If we didn't get high, how did you help me? You know, right. work through right. this. You know? yep. So they can trick you. They can. That is why we have to be on guard. If not, yep. we can't follow the the, the boundaries. But. I don't know. Uh, um, why was the change anyway? Maybe I should ask a question. What, what, why was the change? Because they taught us self-disclosure was good to the benefit. It, it, it was to the benefit of the client. So maybe yes. I'm thinking that the scenario that we gave, maybe the, the counselor told know, maybe I could benefit the client by disclosing this. But he, yes. he might be wrong. So I don't know. I don't know what the cost of the uh, understood. Is. And I love that you're kind of in a quandary about that because 
we should always be asking ourselves about self-disclosure, whether it's appropriate to self-disclose, whether it's not appropriate to self-disclose. And again, if you're not sure, don't do it. And if you're considering it before you do it, maybe talk to somebody about it to figure out, is it relevant to this particular situation? Yeah, Alexandria, we're going to go to you, we're going to go to Dawn, and then we're going to go to Stacy, and then I think we might have to, we'll go to Carmen if we can, and then we might have to start going to the end of our of our conversation for today. Alexandria, the floor is yours. Um, I'm not sure if somebody mentioned this in the chat or not, but yeah. Um, th also, the social worker was giving out medical advice, which, like, you don't know if this person has psychiatric conditions to be saying they need to go on psychotropics. Like, you're not, you're, that's not your scope of practice. Yeah, like, is it even within the scope of practice? And again, I want to I want to remind you of something before we go to Don and then to Stacy and then to Carmen. I asked you, do you think this is realistic? Most of you said yes. So it is possible that somebody, because of the transference or the counter transference, could be so moved that they would get into a very sticky situation. And Alexandra, well observed, way out of your scope of service. Yeah. So we're going to go to Dawn and then we're going to go to Stacy and then we'll go to Carmen. Go ahead, Dawn. Floor is yours. Um I think the biggest thing that hit me was being triggered. That therapist was triggered. Yeah. And obviously, you know, um, some unresolved issues there. And that's yeah. where supervision comes into play. Because bingo. bingo. You, know, you you go and you talk to your supervisor that this is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm experiencing. Oh my God, it's so similar. And you don't bring it to the client, you bring it so you can work on it on your own. Fantastic. And again, that's a professional boundary. I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to work it out in the client. I'm not going to make these recommendations that are out of my scope of care. I'm going to check in with Carolyn about it because I need to talk this through so that I can manage it. And that doesn't mean that the worker's bad. No. It just means the worker needs to do their work, mm -hmm. their personal work. Is that fair, Don? Yeah, very much so. Okay, yeah. fantastic. And one, fantastic. I have one last thing to go right ahead, help, please. Go ahead. Help Michael. I don't know where he is. <laughs> I worked on my master's in mental health counseling in 1993, and when okay. I was training, you didn't disclose at all, and yep. then it changed. So I guess it went back to not disclosing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'll and I'll tell you when I worked in HIV and AIDS. I was often bringing to supervision because clients would say to me, well, are you HIV positive? What do you know uh, about HIV? Exactly. So I, I need, I, that was something that I needed to revisit in supervision a lot to figure out where I sat with that, what my reaction was, what was going to be the most respectful and authentic way to respond. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Stacy, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. I think that it's, it gets tricky only because you still have clients who believe that unless you can identify with them or have a past history and you're not ashamed to share yes. it, that they cannot get help from you. And that's totally untrue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's totally untrue, right? Yeah. But it, I think for some, that they may feel back in the corner and feel like, oh, I must share because in order to get this group to, to hear me or listen to me. Yeah. Um, I've had the pleasure of actually discouraging someone from getting into this field. <laughs> so they said, I think I'll be great in this field because I can identify and I can do this and I can, and I've been through that and that. And, and the first thing they try to do without any credential and or training is counsel their family. Mm -hmm. And I've been through this. And so you mm -hmm. have to understand, this is a person who would come into this field 
and confuse the whole everything that we're trying to not have, right? That confusion. Uh, yeah. Because there's a there's a boundary between yes. the where where you're the client and the counselor. Yep. And then there's this, you don't know more than me, how long you've been doing this? And it can just turn into a meeting, you know, that doesn't really go anywhere. Right. And I, I, I believe, strongly believe that not self-disclosing can't hurt anything. Disclosing, no matter your reason, knowing your crowd can damage things completely. Yep. Can yep. damage it things completely. And yes. we were even told back uh, in 19 blah, 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 that if <laughs> a, client, a, a client of yours worked at the, your neighborhood key food, you should find a different key food. It was that deep, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And it's important to keep those boundaries and, and not to always, I did this, you can do it. If I had to, you have. That's not a way. And I still see a lot of that. In our field, unfortunately, yep. there are still yep. a lot of folks that are, that are doing that. But I yep. think that the best way is to, one, if, if you don't know you're doing that thing, someone has to hear it because you're doing it regularly. Yes. You're not and, just and, doing it once. And so as, as your colleague or as yep. my colleague, we have the right to go to each other and say, hey, listen. We should really be careful with and be open to that. Yep. yep. It's unfortunate that we're not. I'm learning, um, especially after COVID, that people are just kind of bum rushing the business yeah. without much experience. And people who are case IT should telling folks how to take their medications and people who will, <laughs> well, just take it this way. Don't refer, refer, refer. Don't cross the boundary. Yeah. Stay, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Yep. Otherwise, what happens when you don't? We crash. Yep. Yep. Thank Stacy. Thank you so much. And and again, you know, there's something I want to underline before we go to Carmen. And Carmen, I think you're going to get the last word before I say thank you to everybody. Um. And and wow, thank you for what you put on the table, everybody. Um. But I want to underline something that Stacy said that the the awareness about this and the benefit of our coming together as a learning community is why it's good to do this on an annual or biannual basis because it just makes it real and we get to revisit it together and we if if you walk away with nothing and I hope you walk away with something but if you walk away with nothing other than you know I was kind of reminded and now I'm a little more aware of this again that's a benefit to this conversation. So Carmen, the, the floor is yours. So although I understand that the boundaries are very important um, and the whole sharing of your own personal experiences, but what usually works for me is I kind of get to their level and I look at them and listen. I'm not going through what you're going through right now, mm -hmm. but I understand. Mm -hmm. Trust me, I understand. Mm -hmm. With that right there, it says a lot. It mm -hmm. gives them that sense of, okay, she's understanding. She's not telling me a story, but I can feel the genuine behind it. Even if I've gone through the same experience, I don't have to do a self-disclosure. But right. just to even acknowledge the fact that you understand what they're going through it's enough yep. to even bring that level of anxiety down to a point where they are manageable and you're able to assist. Yeah. I don't know if that made any yeah. sense, but yeah. It, it made a lot of sense. And I'll tell you something, Carmen, and, and I'll throw this out for consideration, which is that, and this relates to what Stacy was saying of where the expectation is, well, if you haven't gone through what I've gone through, what? how can you possibly help me? Yeah, I, pro I probably haven't had your experience, and I'm going to do my best to try and understand it from your perspective. Because I want to understand what your experience was like. Again, folks, I cannot thank you enough for everything that you brought to this learning community conversation today. It, it, it's, it's a real 
honor to be able to be part of this conversation with you. I'm going to share my screen and advance to the last slide. We will send you these slides so that you have all of them. I do have a couple of digital guidelines on here that I'd like you to consider, um, but we, we basically talked about those. You can scan this QR code to complete the evaluation. You can also click on the live link that's going to be in the chat. And ha please have a safe evening and uh, looking forward to the next time we're in a learning community conversation together. Thank you so much and um, all the best. Looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much, everybody.